Beyond Reification, Reclaiming Marx's Concept of the Fetish Character of the Commodity by Nicole Pepperell. Introducing the concept of the fetish character of the commodity, Marx describes the phenomenon as one in which the definite social relations between men themselves assumes here for them the fantastic form of relation between things. The meaning of this passage is murky. The language in which social relations are described as assuming a fantastic form is often interpreted as though Max, as though Max, as though Marx understands the fetish character as some sort of ideology in the sense of a distorted perception or false belief that causes what is really a social relation between people to appear as something that this relation is not namely a relation between things. In this interpretation, the relation between things would operate as a sort of veil covering over what is really the fundamental reality, which is a personal relation. On this understanding, critique would consist in stripping back the veil to uncover the real relation underneath. In the text surrounding this quotation, however, Marx makes clear that he does not understand the fetish character of the commodity as a veil that covers over a real relation. Instead, he understands this character as expressive of a very unusual kind of social relation, one specific to capitalist societies, which has the peculiar attribute that it can be taken not to be social at all. He does this first by suggesting that the fetish character of the commodity is not, strictly speaking, a subjective belief or an intersubjective phenomenon. This point becomes clear when Marx sets up but ultimately rejects an analogy between commodity fetishism and religion, Marx argues. In order, therefore, to find an analogy, we must take flight into the misty realm of religion. There, the products of the human brain appear as autonomous figures endowed with a life of their own which enter into relations both with each other and with the human race. So it is in the world of commodities with the products of men's hands. The analogy Marx wants to make is that both fetishism and religion posit the existence of intangible entities, entities that Marx regards as the products of human practice, but which the social actors in question treat as autonomous figures. Marx quickly qualifies, however, that the way that social actors posit intangible entities is not the same in these two cases. Marx suggests that religion involves social actors sharing a common, intersubjectively meaningful belief in the existence of intangible beings. Shared beliefs, products of the human brain, generate collective practices that by inducing social actors to behave as though certain intangible entities exist, constitute these entities as a practical social reality with which social actors must contend in the course of their everyday practice. To generate the fetish character of the commodity, by contrast, Marx argues that this sort of belief is not required. Instead, social actors somehow make the intangible entities Marx describes in terms of commodity fetishism, and they do this with the products of their hands. What this distinction could mean is somewhat unclear at this point in the text. As the argument develops, however, it becomes clearer that Marx intends to draw a distinction between social phenomena that could either be understood purely in cultural terms or solely in terms of intersubjectively meaningful social phenomena and a different kind of social phenomenon one that Marx suggests social actors can create unintentionally prior to integrating it into meaningful, intersubjective belief systems. This distinction becomes important to Marx's claim that political economy only retroactively discovers certain social patterns that Marx regards as intrinsic to capitalist production, and is important to understanding why Marx's concept of the fetish is distinct from many attempts to thematize ideology, which often, which often understand ideology in terms of false consciousness or incorrect belief.
For Marx, the fetish character of capitalist relations is not a veil of illusion to be penetrated, but an important qualitative characteristic of a special kind of social phenomenon that helps to distinguish specifically capitalist relations from the kinds of social relations characteristic of other forms of social life. I return to this point further below, but first I want to focus on the passages in which Marx introduces this distinction. Having suggested that the fetish character of the commodity should not be understood as a belief, Marx goes on to suggest that this character is also not false. He argues, the labor of the private individual manifests itself as an element of the total labor of society only through the relations which the act of exchange establishes directly between the products and through their mediation between the producers. To the producers, therefore, the social relations between their private labors appear as what they are, i.e. they do not appear as direct social relations between persons in their work, but rather as material relations between persons and social, social relations between things. Here, the fantastic form of a relation between things is the definite social relation between men. There is no illusion to be stripped away, no veil to pierce. Yet, if producers see their social relations as what they are, why is this passage framed so critically? Why call this a fetish character? How does Marx understand the standpoint from which he offers his criticism of how things really are? In this paper, I want to explore a possible answer to these questions, one informed by a close reading of the textual strategy of the first volume of Capital that, in particular, draws attention to significant parallels between Marx's work and Hegel's. I frame this reading in contrast to Lucas, uh, Lucas's classic analysis of reification by comparing the two authors' very different understandings of the standpoint and target of critique. Through a close reading of key passages from Marx's text, I draw attention to aspects of Marx's argument that are often overlooked in discussions of the fetish character of the commodity, in particular to the way in which Marx's discussion juxtaposes, rather than contrasts, the categories of use value and value when introducing the concept of the fetish character of the commodity. I argue that, in contrast to Lucas, Marx does not understand the fetish character of the commodity solely in terms of the universalization of a social relation constituted primarily or exclusively by practices of exchange. Instead, Marx points to a much more complex, overarching, genuinely impersonal social relation built out of component social practices that, considered by themselves or as they could be situated within different sorts of relations, would not generate this fetish character. This approach makes it possible for Marx to treat the fetish character of the commodity as a socially, practically real, rather than imaginary or solely ideological phenomenon, one that reflects the aggregate effects or emergent properties that arise when particular component social practices come to be suspended in a particular kind of overarching social relation. In this way, Marx can hold out the possibility for an imminent critique of social relations that exhibit this fetish character, not, however, by declaring the fetish character to be ideological, but by contrasting the negative consequences of such relations with alternative possibilities for collecting life that are anchored in the potentially dis uh, disaggregable parts out of which that overarching relation is built. In this way, Marx can offer the possibility for the practical abolition of the socially real, but transient and transformable phenomenon of a social relation that, so long as it continues to be reproduced, will generate fetish properties. I, be I begin below with a brief reflection on key dimensions of Lucas's analysis of reification. I argue that Lucas positions critique as a process of stripping away illusions in order to unveil an underlying set of social relations that have falsely taken on an appearance of rationality and objectivity. This form of critique is consonant with political strategies that would aim to replace this false rationality and objectivity with something more truly objective and rational, an approach that can provide inadequate critical purchase on technocratic capitalist forms. I argue that Marx's approach, by contrast, seeks to understand how a genuinely impersonal form of social relation 
comes to be generated unintentionally in collective practice. By analyzing the genesis of this social phenomenon, Marx does not seek to unveil it as an illusion. Instead, Marx seeks to reveal the social practices through which this phenomenon has become real and to understand how it continues to be reproduced as a fantastic form of social reality. I argue that Marx attempts to grasp the phenom phenomenon he calls the fetish character of the commodity as an unintended emergent property of the collective performance of a broad range of social practices that are directly oriented to other ends. This social relation, according to Marx, is not intersubjectively meaningful and therefore does not rely on social actors shared belief in or understanding of the relation. Instead, it is an impersonal but still social relation, which has been built out of, co out of component social institutions and forms of social interaction that, looked at individually, do not intrinsically possess the properties that these components help to generate when they are suspended together within a specific relation. This approach enables Marx to open up the possibility for a critique of the overarching relation from the standpoint provided by that relation's own potentially dis disaggregable parts, parts that can now be treated as imminently available materials for constructing alternative forms of collective life, as moments of overarching social conditions we have not chosen, but out of which we nevertheless can build a very different sort of collective history. I have suggested that a close reading of the passages where Marx introduces the fetish character of the commodity suggests that Marx does not view the fetish character as a veil. In his influential interpretation of reification, Lucas cites some of these same passages, yet he reads them through the lens of other elements of Marx's work, in particular in light of passages from much later in Capital that thematize the development of machinery and large-scale production and that analyze structural tendencies toward bureaucratic management. This more eclectic approach to Marx's text enables Lucas to uncover what Lucas presents as Weberian elements in capital, but in a way that obscures Marx's own analysis of such dimensions of capitalist production. This eclecticism allows Lucas to import into Marx his own argument that capitalism is characterized by parallel trends towards the expansion of formalistic mathematical systems through philosophy, government, economics, and culture. Lucas understands these trends as expressions of a socially general privileging of forms of thought that abstract from qualitative specificity. In the same way that Lucas takes market exchange to abstract from the qualitative specificity of the use values of goods. Lucas's approach enables a creative interpretation of capital oriented to the distinctive circumstances of the transition away from liberal capitalism. It also, however, leads Lucas to overlook some of the implications of the passages to which I have drawn attention above. As a consequence, Lucas starts from the position that the concept of the fetish character of the commodity is intended to pick out an illusion, which Lucas describes as a relation between people that takes on the character of a thing and thus acquires a phantom objectivity, an autonomy that seems so strictly rational and all-embracing as to conceal every trace of its, of its fundamental nature, the relation between people. In Lucas's version of the argument, then, there is a hierarchy of levels of social reality that includes a fundamental nature, a relation between people, that is more foundational than other dimensions of social experience, and which is also hidden. Lucas suggests that the fetish character of the commodity describes a social relation that takes on the character of a thing, a relation that appears objective because it seems so strictly rational and all-embracing. Already with this formulation, Lucas is setting up for an argument that capitalism only appears rational and all-encompassing. In reality, however, the argument implies that the system is irrational and insufficiently encompassing. Lucas is reaching for a standpoint of critique that is more fully rational and more genuinely comprehensive, and from which he can convict capitalism for its irrational and partial character. <laughs>
Lucas's critique aligns well, therefore, with a critique of liberal capitalism and of the irrationality of the market from the standpoint of the greater rationality and transparency that will purportedly be provided by centralized, centralized planning. How would this approach differ from the reading of Marx I am proposing? If Marx does not see the fetish character of the commodity as an illusion, and critique does not take the form of penetrating this illusion to capture the reality underneath, what is the standpoint in the target of the critique? My suggestion is that Marx wants to describe the form of a historical dis historically distinctive social relation, a relation that, in his account, does not simply appear objective, but rather is genuinely mediated through social actors' interactions with objects. A social relation, then, that implicates, as one of its moments, a particular relation of social actors to things, and that arises, moreover, as an unintended aggregate result of a diverse range of social practices oriented to various immediate social and material goals. As a consequence, the complex aggregate social relation that confers the fetish character onto commodities, including proletarian workers, who are treated as commodities in human form, has a socially impersonal character that escapes the boundaries of the intersubjective frameworks through which social actors mediate other sorts of social interactions. The critical edge of Marx's analysis does not derive, therefore, from any sort of declaration that this impersonal social relation does not exist or is not truly impersonal. Instead, it derives from the demonstration of how such a peculiar and counterintuitive sort of social relation, one that possesses qualitative characteristics more normally associated with our interactions, interactions with non-social reality, comes to be unintentionally generated in collective practice. Within this framework, critique does not take the form of debunking its object. Instead, critique entails the demonstration of how its object is produced, the demonstration of what sorts of social conditions or practices its object presupposes. It is in this spirit that Marx acknowledges the bounded, socially situated validity of political economy, saying, the categories of bourgeois economy are forms of thought which are socially valid and therefore objective for the relations of production belonging to this historically determined mode of social production. This acknowledgement, however, entrains a critique. Marx intends to convict political economy of not grasping the conditions or presuppositions of its own categories, of not grasping the limits of its own analysis. As capital unfolds, Marx as capital unfolds, Marx will systematically explore those limits in order to demonstrate the ways in which the reproduction of capital, the, practi the practical process that renders the categories of bourgeois economy socially valid, generates possibilities to overturn this transient social validity by effecting determinate practical transformations. Marx's approach, I suggest, points towards an analysis that will accept the contingent social rea reality of the properties of the social relation it sets out to criticize, rather than treating the properties of this relation as illusion that need to be reduced back to something more real. Having started from, from the reality of this relation, however, Marx will then investigate the conflictual mu multiplicity of the constitutive moments that make up the relation, the diversity of social practices that are required to produce it. The result is an analysis of a heterogeneous assemblage of diverse parts that possess particular qualitative attributes as they exist now, as elements situated within a particular overarching social relation, but they can also be examined for the qualitative attributes these parts could potentially possess if reassembled into different sorts of wholes. By carefully and systematically exploring the divergent implications of various moments of the reproduction of capital and speculatively teasing apart how those moments exist within this process from how they might exist outside it, Marx can thus investigate diverse imminent potentials to develop the conflictual possibilities for novel forms of practice that are currently being incubated within the reproduction of capital. Where Lucas's work points toward a more rational, transparent, and comprehensive realization of the potentials generated by capitalism 
Marx's work points toward the creative multiplication of diverse potentials that can be realized only by bursting through the constraints imposed by the reproduction of capital. Returning to Lucas, I have suggested above that Lucas conceptualizes the fetish character of the commodity different, differently from Marx. That Lucas takes the argument about the fetish to be a claim that critique must strip away an illusion to reveal an underlying reality, rather than a claim that critique must grasp how a distinctive relation comes to be produced in a specific form. At the same time, Lucas also operates with a different notion of the commodity than the one Marx puts into play. On the one hand, consonant with my interpretation of Marx's text, Lucas senses that the category of the commodity is intended to pick out more than just an object or a thing, and that Marx's analysis of the commodity is intended to cast light on more than just the economic dimensions of capitalist society. On the other hand, Lucas understands this category in a particularly un univocal, one-dimensional manner, arguing, at this stage in the history of mankind, there is no problem that does not ultimately lead back to that question, and there is no solution that could not be found in the solution to the riddle of commodity structure. The problem of commodities must not be considered in isolation or even regarded as the central problem in economics, but as the central structural problem of capitalist society in all its aspects. Only in this case can the structure of commodity relations be made to yield a model of all the objective forms of bourgeois society together with all the subjective forms corresponding to them. Yet Lucas conceptualizes the commodity relation as being affected through the social practices of market exchange, which Lucas understands in terms of the exchange of goods on the market. This understanding of the commodity relation presents a, dile a dilemma, which to his credit, Lucas explicitly recognizes. Market exchange long predates the phenomena Lucas wants to pick out with the term commodity fetishism. And so Lucas must account for how a very old social practice should suddenly come to generate qualitatively different effects in recent history, which the social practice did not generate in the past. To get around this dilemma, Lucas hits on the solution that the fetish character of the commodity arises only when the commodity relation, the exchange relation, has become totalized. He argues, what is at issue here, however, is the question, how far is commodity exchange together with its structural consequences able to influence the total outer and inner life of society? Lucas suggests that the quantitative expansion of social practices that affect exchange relations to the point where such relations become totalizing affects a qualitative shift that generates the historically specific phenomena associated with the fetish character of the commodity. Prior to this totalization, according to Lucas, it was still possible to see through the veil and to recognize the personal character of the commodity relation. As Lucas frames it, the personal nature of economic relations was still understood clearly on occasion at the start of capitalist development, but as the process advanced and forms became more complex and less direct, it became increasingly difficult and rare to find anyone penetrating the veil of reification. Lucas therefore interprets the commodity relation as a personal relation deriving from the practice of market, market exchange which begins to generate novel consequences as this relation expands beyond the boundaries it occupied in earlier forms of social life. Among these novel consequences is what Lucas calls reification, in which the personal character of the social relation comes to be veiled and social actors assume a contemplative stance toward a relation that has come to appear objective and personal and beyond their control. Once Lucas has posed the problem in this way, he sets critique the task of piercing the veil to reveal the personal character of the underlying relation. Since the personal relation is understood to relate to market exchange, critique and political contestation are here appointed to the overthrow of the market and the institutionalization of state planning, within which the rationality and objectivity that were only illusory under capitalism could finally achieve social reality. So how, does the so how does this differ from what I am suggesting is Marx's own argument 
I have already suggested above that Marx does not view the fetish character of the commodity as an illusion to be pierced, but rather as a phenomenon with practical social validity within a complex, aggregate social relation. The core theoretical problem for Marx is therefore not, not how to pierce an illusion, but how to understand the practical generation of a peculiar and oppressive social relation so that it becomes clearer what sorts of political actions would be required to dismantle it. I have further suggested that there is some sense in which Marx maintains that this complex relation, although social is the sense of originating in human practice, is somehow not intersubjectively meaningful at the point that it is constituted in social practice, that the appearance that capitalist society is characterized by material relations between persons and social relations between things is not an illusion to be penetrated but somehow expresses an important, historically specific insight into how things really are, and therefore casts an important light on a qualitatively distinctive feature of capitalist societies. Does this mean that Marx understands the fetish character of the commodity as the result of social practices oriented primarily to market exchange, but sees the market as somehow more impersonal than Lucas does? Or is something beyond market exchange intended when Marx uses the category of the commodity to pick out a form of social relation? To address these questions, I need first to take a closer look at the opening paragraphs of the discussion of the fetish character of the commodity, situating these paragraphs in relation to the dramatic structure of the chapter as a whole. This discussion provides the foundation for understanding how Marx understands the peculiar social character of commodity producing labor. When Marx opens his discussions of the fetish character of the commodity, the first point he makes is that use value cannot account for this phenomenon. He argues, A commodity appears at first sight an extremely obvious, trivial thing, but its analysis shows that it is a very strange thing, abounding in metaphysical subtleties and theological niceties. So far as it is a value in use, there is nothing mysterious about it. But as soon as it steps forth as a commodity, it changes into a thing that transcends sensuousness. Lucas joins many other interpreters in concluding that Marx's point here is to distinguish use value from exchange value, and to argue that fetishism arises from the practice of tossing use values into the cauldron of the market. A close look at the text, however, suggests that Marx is trying to argue something else entirely. The opening sentences of the fetish character section, I suggest, should be read as a quick summation of the first three sections of the opening chapter of Capital. To review these sections quickly, Capital opens by telling us how the wealth of capitalist societies appears, which initially is in the form of an immense collection of commodities. These commodities are immediately sensuous, directly perceptible external objects things that are the objects of human contemplation. <coughs> These sensuous objects are then described as possessing a dual nature, combining use value presented in this opening section as a transhistorical substance of wealth anchored in the objective material properties of things, and exchange value presented in this opening section as a contingent and an arbitrary and transient social form of wealth connected only contingently to the material substance of use value. On a first reading, this opening discussion can seem to be merely definitional, a setting out of the terms and ground rules that will continue to inform the subsequent discussion. A couple of pages in, however, the text introduces a strange dramatic twist. A second voice intrudes, openly contradicting the claims of the first, empiricist voice. The second voice insists that the wealth of capitalist society in fact cannot be adequately understood with reference to the commodity's directly perceptible sensuous properties. Behind this sensible phenomena of use value and exchange value lies another super sensible realm, the realm of the categories of value and human labor in the abstract. These supersensible categories cannot be directly perceived, but their existence can nevertheless be intuited by reason, a process 
the second transcendental voice now proceeds to demonstrate through a series of deductions reminiscent of Descartes' critique of sense perception, in which purport to derive the categories of value and abstract labor as something like transcendental conditions of possibility for commodity exchange. This transcendental voice then gives way in its turn to a dialectical voice, which presents a derivation of the money form in order to argue that the wealth of capitalist society cannot be adequately grasped in terms of either immediately sensible categories like use value and exchange value or super sensible ess essences like value and abstract labor, but rather must be grasped in terms of a dynamic relation that through a series of dialectical inversions connects together antinomic moments into a contradictory whole. The order and content of this movement from sense perception via a transcendental analysis of a supersensible world through a confrontation with an inverted world, opening out on the reflexive analysis presented in the section on the fetish character of the commodity, is not unique to the opening chapter of Capital. This structure mirrors the dramatic movement of the early chapters of Hegel's phenomenology of mind. Where Hegel follows consciousness in its quest to achieve certainty over its object. In these chapters, consciousness assumes a number of different shapes in successive, unstable attempts to achieve cert to achieve certainty by taking its object to be a world of supersensible universals that subside behind the flux of sensible phenomena. This new shape in turn comes to be undermined through the confrontation with something Hegel calls the inverted world, which finally drives consciousness to realize self-reflexively that its object does not reside outside itself, that consciousness has been its own object all along. The narrative structure of the opening chapter of Capital reenacts this Hegelian drama, translating Hegel's high drama into a burlesque parody that recounts not consciousness's quest for certainty of its object, but a debauched quest to grasp the wealth of capitalist society. This periodic rendition of Hegel's storyline foreshadows the analytical trajectory Marx will follow over the next several chapters. That the wealth of capitalist society cannot be adequately grasped so long as we try to grasp this wealth as an object outside us. Whether this object is understood in terms of a sensible property, supersensible entity, or dialectical relation. Instead, we must achieve the insight that we are the wealth we are attempting to grasp, that in spite of appearances, the wealth of capitalist society is a subjective entity, living, fluid, human labor. Marx's reflexive analysis will unfold this conclusion. Not, however, in order to unveil the secret intrinsic social centrality of human labor to the production of material wealth, but in order to criticize a runaway form of production that continues compulsively to reproduce an immaterial social requirement for the expenditure of human labor power, no matter how high the growth of productivity or material wealth. In the opening chapter of Capital, this conclusion is hinted, but not yet rendered explicit, through the subtle textual parallel with Hegel's work. This parody of Hegel's narrative provides the narrative frame that leads up to Marx's discussion of the fetish character of the commodity. In the opening of the, dis of the discussion of the fetish, Marx briefly re recapitulates the main lines of the opening narrative of the chapter. Thus, when Marx states that a commodity appears at first sight an extremely obvious, trivial thing, he refers to the position articulated by the empiricist voice that opens the chapter and that attempts to grasp wealth in terms of properties directly evident to sense perception. Marx flags that the transcendental and dialectical voices have contested this empiricist perception by arguing that the chapter has shown that the commodity is a very strange thing, abounding in metaphysical subtleties and theological niceties. If readers had missed missed the strategic intention of the text when working through these earlier sections. Marx is, Marx is telling them explicitly in his opening sentence here that he does not endorse the form 
in which these earlier arguments were presented. There is some sense in which the perspectives articulated in the earlier sections of the chapter express, and yet are not fully adequate to the phenomenon they are seeking to grasp. Marx intends the reader to be in on the joke, implicit in the order and structure of the opening sections. Believing his readers have been following this rather subtle bit of textual play, Marx now thinks he has adequately set up the puzzle, whose solution is the concept of the fetish character of the commodity, the puzzle of why what Marx takes to be the self-evidently deranged categories outlined in the first three sections of this chapter should, in spite of their bizarreness, possess a social validity under capitalism the puzzle of how these apparently mystical forms of thinking express something that is socially, practically real. Readers know at this point in the text, if they did not know before, that the strategic intention of the earlier sections of this chapter is to illustrate historically distinctive forms of thought, forms of thought that express different aspects of the peculiar properties generated by a social relation that possesses a fetish character. In this section on the fetish character of the commodity, Marx then finally begins to discuss the sort of analysis that needs to be undertaken in order to account for how these forms of thought come to be socially valid. Marx begins by outlining what does not account for the fetish. This is the context in which Marx comments on use value in the quotation above. Use value, he argues, if you could abstract it from the commodity relation, contains nothing that would generate the sort, the sorts of seemingly metaphysical properties. Marx believes he has illustrated earlier in the chapter. The analysis of use value abstracted from the commodity relation, therefore cannot explain why the empiricist, transcendental, and dialectical voices are socially valid. Many commentators, including Lucas, assume that by talking about use value here, Marx is aiming to set up a contrast with exchange value. It is therefore common to overlook the specific move that Marx makes next in the text. Immediately after arguing that the component elements of use value do not account for the fetish character of the commodity, Marx insists, in an exact parallel to the preceding argument about use value, that the component parts of value also do not account for the fetish character of the commodity form. Marx writes, The mystical character of the commodity does not therefore arise from its use value, just as little does it proceed from the nature of the determinants of value. So neither the determinants of use value abstracted from the commodity relation, nor the, the, nor the determinants of value abstracted from the commodity relation explain the fetish. What does explain the fetish then for Marx? The answer is that the commodity relation itself explains the fetish. The fetish arises not from any of the component parts of the commodity relation, but rather from the aggregate relation into which these component parts have come to be suspended. Marx expresses this point in the following way. Whence then arises the enigmatic character of the product of labor, so soon as it assumes the form of a commodity? Clearly, it arises from this form itself. In other words, Marx is trying to make an argument here, not about the contrast between the between use value and exchange value, but rather about the way in which a relation can be comprised of many parts, and yet have distinctive qualitative characteristics that cannot be found in any of those parts when the parts are analyzed independently of that relation. In more contemporary terms, Marx is making an argument here about emergence, about the possibility for properties to arise within some overarching assemblage without those properties reflecting the attributes that any of the component parts of that assemblage might manifest if these parts were examined in isolation, or as they might exist if situated within some other sort of relation. Within this context, the sorts of perspectives outlined in the opening sections of Capital simultaneously express aspects of the real properties of a social relation but also overlook the distinctive contribution that the relation makes to the qualitative characteristics expressed by its own moment, its own moments. Marx opens up here the possibility for an imminent critique of forms of thought that confuse the attributes that parts possess within a particular relation for attributes that are essential or intrinsic to those parts.
thereby naturalizing the overarching relationship and missing opportunities to examine what alternative properties those parts might acquire if they could be reassembled into different social configurations. The critical strategy of capital involves breaking down the overarching process of the reproduction of capital into its con constitutive moments, and then exploring the characteristics those moments possess within the process of the reproduction of capital, precisely in order that, precisely in order then, to distinguish these characteristics from what might become possible if those moments could be extracted from this process. This approach allows Marx to offer a critique of the whole from the standpoint of the potentially disaggregable parts, a very different concept of the standpoint and the target of critique than that offered by Lucas. Among many other implications, this approach provides Marx with a much more supple meaning or means of explaining the historical specificity of the fetish character of the commodity than Lucas has at his disposal. When Lucas equates the commodity relation with market exchange and then notes that market exchange is historically quite old, he finds himself forced into the position that the quantitative expansion of market relations at some point leads to a qualitative shift, a move that then leaves him confronted with a totalizing social relation whose power and pervasiveness make critique difficult to conceptualize. Lucas's ultimately mystical evocation of the proletariat as the subject-object of history can be understood in part as a response necessitated by the power and coherence he has already ceded to capitalism by conceptualizing it in such a totalizing fashion. Marx has another option. He argues that many of the component moments that participate in the commodity relation, markets, money, division of labor, and other factors are certainly conditions or integral elements of the reproduction of capital. Many of these same moments, however, have also existed in other forms of social life without their existence generating the same fetish character. What has changed to generate the distinctive properties Marx associates with the fetish is the recent recombination of these older moments into a new configuration that constitutes a historically unique form of social relation. In chapter six, where Marx analyzes the market for labor power, he finally makes explicit what he regards this something new to be, arguing the historical conditions of capital's existence are by no means given with the mere circulation of money and commodities. It arises only when the owner of the means of production and subsistence finds the free worker available on the market as the seller of his own labor power. And this one historical precondition comprises a world's history. This new factor combines with inherited elements into a novel relation with unprecedented historical consequences. Interestingly, Lucas actually reverses Marx's argument in his own discussion of free labor, arguing, only when the whole life of society is thus fragmented into the isolated acts of commodity exchange can the free worker come into being. At the same time, his fate becomes the typical fate of the whole society. For Lucas, therefore, the totalization of the market eventually engulfs even labor itself. For Marx, by contrast, the generalization of a market in labor power is one among several institutional innovations that operate together to transform markets into such a dynamic force. From Marx's point of view, Lucas could be said to naturalize the dynamism of the market, treating the qualitative characteristics the market possesses only within a particular social configuration as an intrinsic character, at least once a certain quantitative threshold has been crossed. In this account, the distinctive qualitative social transformations that historically coincide with the emergence of capitalist production are not the result of a qualitatively novel form of social relation, but are instead understood in terms of the quantitative expansion of institutions posited to possess imminent characteristics that were somehow held in check in previous historical periods, but become manifest once those institutions become totalizing. Unlike Lucas, Marx does not need to claim that market relations become totalized and all-encompassing, nor does he need to reduce all forms of social objectivity and subjectivity back to any single factor.
This is because Marx is talking about the emergence of a social relation that is both genuinely new and yet also exhibits distinctive properties that arise as aggregate effects from complex interactions among a number of different component, different component parts. Marx's stance points towards a form of theory that grasps capitalism as an assemblage, whose various component parts and sub-relations might potentially point in multiple divergent directions. How does Marx make clear that he intends to analyze an assemblage of this sort rather than simply identifying a specific single relation? The exchange of labor for a wage, perhaps, as the central structuring institution that confers a distinctive social character on, label, on labor in capitalist societies. To answer this question, it is important to distinguish what Marx regards as an essential condition or presupposition of capitalism from the commodity relation implicated in the argument about the fetish character of the commodity. In Marx's argument, the emergence of a labor market figures as a condition for capitalism, and capitalism figures as a condition for generalized commo commodity production, and therefore for the social validity of the categories expressed in the opening chapter. In spite of this, the impersonal social relation being discussed in the section on the fetish character of the commodity cannot be reduced to the wage uh, relation or to the existence of a labor market. This point becomes clear in Marx's own discussion of the fetish character when he claims to have already shown the distinctive social nature of labor under capitalism in the first chapter. Marx writes, As the foregoing analysis has already demonstrated, this fetishism of the world of commodities arises from the peculiar social character of the labor that produces them. How do we know that the peculiar social character of the labor Marx refers to here is not the wage relation Marx discusses in chapter 6? We know this because Marx says as much in chapter 6, when he argues that the analysis of wage labor would have been foreign to the analysis of commodities. Of commodities. In other words, Marx's argument about the fetish character of the commodity does not depend on his later analysis of wage labor, to establish what is peculiar about the social character of the labor that produces commodities. Something else must be going on in the first chapter for Marx to claim that the foregoing analysis has already demonstrated this peculiar character. So what does Marx believe he has shown? I cannot develop this argument in full in the space available here, but I can at least gesture to the type or argument Marx believes he has made. My suggestion is that the peculiar social character of commodity producing labor, as Marx describes it in the opening chapter of Capital, consists precisely in the fact that, in capitalism, social, actor, social actors unintentionally generate a real abstraction, social labor, that is distinguished in practice from the aggregate of the empirical laboring activities in which those actors independently engage. Social actors do not set out to generate such an entity, yet they generate it nevertheless, bringing it into existence unintentionally, in Marx's terms, through the mediation of the products of their hands. What Marx is doing here is casting an anthropologist's gaze on an implicit logic of social practice, that we indigenous inhabitants of capitalist society take so much for granted that it is difficult for us to appreciate the extent to which this logic pervades our habits of embodiment and perception, practice and thought. In a very preliminary way in the opening chapter, Marx has begun to suggest that there are strange consequences to the actions we undertake in order to survive in a society in which empirical laboring activities are undertaken speculatively, without certain knowledge of whether those activities will ultimately be allowed to account as part of social labor. Marx is arguing that the practice of producing commodities for market exchange in a capitalist context introduces a disjuncture between empirical efforts expended in production and the degree to which those efforts will be rewarded once the products of labor are exchanged on the market. Marx is suggesting that capitalist production involves the collective enactment of a non-conscious collective social judgment that determines which empirical activities get to count as part of social labor. This practical distinction between empirical labors, 
actually undertaken in labors whose products succeed in market exchange enlists social actors, wittingly or no, in behaving as though there exists an intangible entity, social labor, that exists both within and yet distinct from the aggregate of laboring activities that social actors undertake. This collective behavior constitutes social labor as a practical reality that unintentionally bestows a special social status on an elect of privileged laboring activities, but only after the fact, once production is long complete. There's no way for social actors to deduce in advance through a synchronic empirical examination of the sensuous properties of the labor process or the goods produced, which sorts of activities will succeed in gaining social recognition when cast into market exchange. Social labor is therefore, in Marx's vocabulary, a supersensible, sensible entity, an abstract, intangible subset of the universal of the universe of empirically laboring activities actually undertaken whose composition remains inscrutable at any given moment in time because the category is fundamentally retroactive. Social labor is a category that will have been a category perpetually out of sync with any given moment in time, something that social actors unintentionally constitute by acting in ways that reduce and distill the laboring activities they have empirically undertaken down to a smaller subset of laboring activities that are encouraged to reproduce themselves over time because their products have been socially validated through market exchange. The result of this unintentional collective reduction of empirical laboring activities to those that get to count as social labor is what Marx has earlier attempted to pick out through the supersensible sensible categories of abstract labor and value. This process by which empirical laboring activities are culled down to those activities that get to count as part of social labor is impersonal and objective in a number of different senses. Marx describes the process as happening behind the backs of the social actors whose practices generate it as unintentional and therefore apparently objective. The process is moreover mediated via the exchange of objects and is thus genuinely carried out via the constitution of social relations between things. Also, although this point is only hinted at in the opening chapter, the process involves a strange form of mutual compulsion in which social actors place pressure on one another to conform to average conditions of production, thus resulting in a form of collective systemic coercion that is separable from any personal social relations that social actors may also constitute. In each of these respects, Marx argues the commodity relation is genuinely objective and impersonal. There is no illusion of objectivity to be pierced, only an impersonal form of social relation to be grasped and, if possible, overcome. From this standpoint, it becomes possible to see the forms of thought expressed in the opening sections of the first chapter of Capital as socially valid, even though these forms of thought contradict one another. The opening empiricist voice that perceives use values and exchange value but overlooks the intangible entities of abstract labor and value is a plausible but partial perspective that picks up on a particular dimension of the commodity relation. That is the dimension that manifests itself in empirical goods and money. The transcendental voice picks up on the existence of certain real abstractions certain intangible entities that cannot be directly perceived by the senses, but whose existence can be inferred. The dialectical voice picks up on the relational and dynamic character of both the sensible and supersensible dimensions of the commodity relation, and analyzes the way in which these antinomic phenomena mutually implicate one another and are reproduced together over time. All of these perspectives are reasonable approximations of a dimension of social experience under capitalism, and yet they point to theoretical analysis in different directions and suggest very different possibilities for practice. Marx's own method, which he will develop in much greater detail as capital unfolds, consists in tracing out a wide array of dimensions of social experience and tying these dimensions back to types of formal theory,
or popular ideals that express their potentials. With each step, Marx traces the validity and the limits of the dimensions of social experience that he analyzes, working to differentiate the qualitative characteristics that derive from the overarching process of the reproduction of capital from the potentials that could be released if this overarching process were overcome. Lucas criticizes capitalism for terraforming social existence by covering over the qualitative diversity of sensuous experience with an abstract, formalistic monoculture. His univocal vision of capitalism drives his critique in the direction of a counter-totality, even more comprehensive and rational than what he supposes. Marx, by contrast, understands critique as a sort of autopsy performed on a monstrous Frankensteinian creation. This autopsy enables Marx to demonstrate the stitches that hold the great beast together, to trace the active and sometimes precarious efforts that are continuously required to animate the creature, and to draw attention to the ways in which the history and present potentials of the transplanted parts suggest promising opportunities for future dismemberment and decomposition. These two approaches suggest radically different concepts of the standpoint and target of critique, with Marx's approach, I suggest, offering far greater possibilities, methodologically and substantively, for reconceptualizing capitalism and its critique in the contemporary era.